of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, earnings season is in full swing with IBM delivering strong results thanks to cloud sales. Does this signal a bullish quarter for tech? Plus, Uber makes a splash at the World Economic Forum in Davos, giving new details about its self-driving cars. We'll bring you the highlights of our conversation with CEO Dara Khosrowshahi. And Netflix's Hollywood milestone, the streaming giant, gets its first ever Best Picture Oscar nomination, cementing its place in the film industry. First, to our lead shares of IBM, rose the most in a decade after the company gave a positive forecast for 2019 and fourth quarter results beat analyst estimates. Morgan Stanley called it the cleanest quarter in years thanks to growth in the cloud and artificial intelligence. To discuss, we caught up with Bloomberg Intelligence senior analyst Anurag Rana in New York Tuesday. The surprise actually was one of their divisions called Global Business Services. Saw some very strong consulting numbers, which you know to us means that enterprise tech spending is very strong right now. Uh, and it's you know the follow through effect from a very strong 2018. Well, IBM has been saying over and over again that, you know, the cloud would be big, uh, IBM would get there, but there had been a lot of doubt as to whether IBM could really keep up with some of the perhaps more nimble competitors. Is this proof that IBM can live up to these promises? See, as far as cloud is concerned, we think the real test is going to be when the Red Hat acquisition is closed and they are able to offer more products. Now, you know, their cloud revenue is somewhere between 10 and 20 percent, depending on the, the quarter. You know, that's far lower than even the larger players such as Amazon and Microsoft. They're growing cloud at a much, much faster pace on the infrastructure side and on the application side. You know, companies like Salesforce and Workday, you know, they're growing north of 20 percent. So, um, you know, in contrast, IBM being such a small player uh, compared to all of them, uh, you know, its its growth rate is okay, but it's not, you know, it's not it's it's not great. For many years, IBM has also been touting some of these other initiatives, like Watson, like what it's doing with the Weather Channel, like quantum computing. And the question has always been, well, when is this going to add to the bottom line? I recently spoke with IBM CEO Ginny Rometty, and she actually had some specifics in terms of when quantum computing revenue would be impactful for IBM. Take a listen to what she had to say. What's the time frame till quantum really produces commercial results? And we're probably in a two to five year time frame that you'll actually start to see commercial businesses doing real commercial applications. And then that means revenue. Is this going to be a big business for IBM? See, those that would be a decade away easily because, you know, think about it. You know, just to even come up with a billion dollars or so, it would take several years to get there. And the size of the company is, you know, $70, $80 billion in revenue. So, you know, it would be a very small drop. The real big, again, you know, one of the things we said was when the Red Hat acquisition is closed, they give you a lot more software products for them to sell and make them a lot more relevant when it comes to private cloud or hybrid cloud. Meantime, I have a chart here in the Bloomberg looking at the three most valuable companies, Apple, Amazon, and Microsoft. You can see uh, the, the blue and yellow line, Amazon and Microsoft uh, surging ahead, taking the market cap crown from Apple. And of course, we see uh, the market certainly favoring growth in software, growth in services. Does IBM have what it takes, uh, have what investors are optimistic about? See, as far as uh, cloud is concerned, we think IBM is, uh, you know, just a third or fourth when it comes to public cloud. But they can really make a dent with this Red Hat acquisition and be one of the top leading players when it comes to private cloud installations or when it comes to uh, hybrid cloud. You know, that's where a large portion of the spending is going to go for the next several years. And in our view, Microsoft is very well positioned and, uh, you know, the Red Hat deal can help uh, IBM strategic positioning as well. That said, it's a huge deal, $33 billion. What's the confidence that's going to close and there won't be a competing bid? Oh, that, uh, that's a very tough uh, question. I would be not the right person to answer that. But, you know, having said that, uh, you know, we haven't seen any bids at this point. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what, what happens in the next six months. Um, but if this does close, you know, it gives IBM, uh, you know, we think, again, you know, we think it makes them relevant again when it comes to, you know, next generation computing. 
Well, the World Economic Forum took place in Davos, Switzerland this week, and tech was at the center of the conversation. Top tech executives, including Facebook, Sheryl Sandberg, and Uber's Dara Khosrowshahi, joined several world leaders to address global problems from transportation to regulation. Our Bloomberg senior executive editor of Global Tech, Brad Stone, sent us this report Wednesday from the scene. Transportation was on the agenda at the World Economic Forum in Davos this week. I sat down for a panel discussion with Uber CEO Dara Khosrowshahi, UPS CEO David Abney, and Boeing CEO Dennis Mullenberg. There were no regulators on the panel, so all three CEOs were able to wax optimistically about the future of mobility. We talked about autonomous driving, air taxis, drones, and the Hyperloop. All three CEOs are eager to change how people view their companies and to bring new solutions to moving around within cities and between cities and and around the world to their customers. It's difficult to pinpoint one consistent theme when it comes to technology at the World Economic Forum in Davos this week. The topics of panel discussions have ranged widely from the impact of facial recognition technologies to privacy in the digital, digital age to the demographics of the gig workforce. Of course, Davos always provides an opportunity for CEOs to signal their virtues and to talk about their passions. Mark Benioff of Salesforce is here talking about the responsibility he believes CEOs have to give back to the community. Bill Gates is here talking about his objectives in terms of global health. Sheryl Sandberg is here at Davos talking about the way in which she thinks publishers can succeed on the Facebook ecosystem. Last year at Davos, there was a clear sense that tech CEOs were here to apologize for the impact that they had on democracy. This year, there's a prevailing sense, I believe, that the world's problems, dysfunction in Washington, D.C., the Brexit stalemate in the U.K., that the world's problems have eclipsed the problems of Silicon Valley. This is Brad Stone from Bloomberg reporting from the World Economic Forum in Davos. Coming up, Tesla announces it's cutting back on production of the Model X and S vehicles. Will profitability once again be under pressure for the company? And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Tesla has announced it's reduced the number of hours it's producing Model 3 sedans and Model X crossovers. The move has added to concerns about demand for Tesla's higher priced and more profitable cars. Bloomberg's Dana Hull broke the story and talked about it with Selena Wang. Workers at the Tesla factory last week were very concerned that layoffs were in the works because they had heard that production of Model S and X was going to be cut back. And then last Friday, Musk sent an email saying that he was laying off 7% of the workforce. The significance here is that this is the first time that the layoffs are actually hitting production workers, not just salaried like sales, HR and marketing people, but people who actually work in the factory. So um, now we're hearing that, yeah, S and X production has been cut back. We don't know exactly how much. It's not that surprising because they did drop the lower priced model and now all effort is on the Model 3. I mean, is all of this a sign that the challenges of scaling up, selling at high prices, delivering large margins, is all of this coming to a head? It seems to be. I mean, the Model S and X have been out for quite a while. The Model S first went into production in 2012, so it's a seven-year-old car. Most people who want a Model S have one already, and there's just the demand for those um, those cars may not be as strong as it used to be. And the price difference between the lowest price Model S and the 3, it was not as wide, so that's why they dropped the 75 kilowatt version. Right, in addition to the production cuts, they also had the pricing cut, so it seems that demand is coming to a ceiling? Perhaps, yeah. And we, we'll find out more when Tesla reports earnings next week as to how many Model S's and X's do they plan to make this year? Is it still 100,000? Are they going to cut that back? We haven't gotten a lot of forward-looking guidance for the year. And Musk said back in October that Europe and China might offset some of the slowdown in the U.S., but now we're seeing this economic slowdown in China, a weak retail sales. Is this going to hurt that prediction he had? Yeah, I mean, China has always been a wild card for Tesla because of the tariffs and the trade war. And but, but Tesla has, is a strong brand. But now we're, you know, the, everyone is concerned about the Chinese auto market slowing down. And is Tesla going to be able to kind of swim through that or not? Or how how fast are they going to get this Gigafactory up and running? Right. We saw Apple really get hurt by China revenue forecast. Is there a sense in Tesla that? Some of the growing nationalism in China, in addition to the economic slowdown, could hurt these numbers? It, it could. I mean, I don't think we have a clear indication. 
reputation yet. I mean, Tesla, had, Tesla got a very warm reception when it went to Shanghai for this gigafactory groundbreaking. And so the sense is that they're actually racing to build this factory so that they could start producing there. Right. How does that factory figure into all of this? I mean, you have job cuts here, production slowdown, and then you have this huge $5 billion plan in Shanghai. Yeah, we still don't have a lot of details as to how that plant is being financed. The rumor was that it's largely through local Chinese debt, but we don't know the terms. We don't know which banks are involved. And then they have, they have to build that plant in order to avoid the tariff issue, which makes the cars really cost prohibitive in China. So we've had some recent very negative analyst reports on Tesla. You know, Tesla keeps on getting beat. The shares keep on falling after each round of news. I mean, what's making investors most skittish right now? I think for a long time, the Tesla narrative was that it's a growth company. It's a high growth company. They, they spend a lot, but they're growing, growing, growing because there's this like off the hook demand for their products. Now the demand question is really caused, it is really up for grabs because this is the first time that Tesla has actually pulled back on production. And when we talk about production, how much of that layoff is actually uh, increasing efficiency at Tesla and how much of it is we just can't sell enough of these cars? Well, that's that's a really good question. We don't have details from the state of California yet as to which which positions were cut, but certainly production hours and production go hand in hand. On the one hand, like if you become incredibly efficient, you don't need as much labor, but you also don't need as much labor if you're not making as many cars. And when you talk to sources who are still at the company, what is morale like? It's pretty bad. I mean, in June, Elon Musk laid off 9% saying that it was a hard decision, but he had to do it so that he would never have have to do it again. Seven months later, he's laying off another 7%. And a lot of these people are folks who sort of, you know, they made it through the first round of layoffs in June thinking that they were safe. They, they turned down other job opportunities. This came as a real surprise to people. And in that announcement on the job cuts, Elon Musk said it's going to be a very difficult road ahead. I mean, what are some of the turning points we're expecting to see in 2019 for this company? Well, they really need to get this $35,000 car, which they've been promising since March of 2016, out the door. And until that car is out, they're going to be in real trouble because basically that's what people have been waiting for for years. And, the, and the, they've sort of already sold the higher price version to everyone in the U.S. that they can. Hulu is responding to Netflix's price hike by lowering the cost of a subscription. The on-demand video service has cut the price of its entry-level ad-supported product by 25 percent to six dollars a month. Remember, just last week, Netflix raised the cost of its most popular plan to 13 dollars a month. Coming up, a new report from eMarketer outlines why China's e-commerce growth is still booming despite an economic slowdown in the region. And later, our exclusive conversation with Priscilla Chan about the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative's latest push to impact the housing crisis in San Francisco. That's next. This is Bloomberg. This week in Davos, Huawei's deputy chair, Ken Hu, weighed in on the ongoing impact of the global trade war. We've seen, you know, the uh, damaging e effect on many of the, you know, uh, uh, companies, including Huawei and uh, some of the sectors uh, from the from the trade war. And uh, uh, as the technology industry, we're highly relying on the global supply chain and the global, uh, you know, innovation ecosystem. So uh, we are probably, you know, suffering the most right now. This all while the United States is urging its allies to avoid using Huawei's equipment for fear it could be used in espionage, something the company has repeatedly denied. I spoke with Sam Sachs, cybersecurity policy and China digital economy fellow at New America on Tuesday to discuss. The Chinese government has stated that they want to have Chinese global brands that are competing um, in high-tech sectors. So it's a real blow for companies like Huawei, which have managed to be global titans in many regards. And I think that a lot of Chinese tech companies, and beyond the tech sector as well, are beginning to reevaluate their plans to move into markets which are subject to U.S. influence on this. Sam, there's certainly an argument to be made that regional economies are more closely intertwined than we understand. I have a chart here in the Bloomberg which shows that if manufacturing slows down in China, that actually impacts the United States economy. Does he have a point when he says that the trade war is going to be damaging for global tech? 
The reality is that the tech sectors are highly interconnected, not just the U.S. and China, but globally. And so when we're looking at unwinding supply chains, walking back joint R&D, global partnerships, this is something that is not easy to do. There are a number of U.S. companies that are seriously reevaluating, reorienting away from China. But there are frankly some things that are not possible and are extremely costly to undertake. But these conversations are certainly going on. And of course, Canada also reviewing the use of Huawei or the access of Huawei into their 5G network. We're actually able to catch up with the Foreign Minister of Canada, Christian Freeland, at Davos. So take a listen to what she had to say. Canada has spoken to the United States about the case. It is, it's a decision for the United States whether to seek an extradition of someone from Canada, whether it is a Canadian or a visitor. That's up to them. And then they have to make the case for the extradition in our legal system. Getting Huawei CFO extradited to the U.S. could take years. Will this be the thorn in U.S.-China relations long after a deal is potentially made? So over the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of rumors. Is Meng actually going to be extradited? Is she going to be released? And there's a lot of uncertainty around this. It's so sensitive because of the trade negotiations. But the reality is, look, even if Meng is released, the U.S. ambitions to dismantle Huawei are much bigger than this arrest on Meng. There is a whole of government effort to take down Huawei, and I think we're going to see it even if the Meng case drags on. But it was not just about Huawei. Last year, we saw this supplier ban against ZTE as well. Of course, that was eventually lifted. Um, that nearly crushed the company. Huawei has some vertical integration. So I wonder how will it compare and how well positioned is Huawei compared to ZTE last year in overcoming all of this? ZTE was so dependent on the U.S. market that a denial ban would have brought the company to its knees. I think it's not as grave for Huawei, but when we're talking about the U.S. going out to the Five Eyes partners and saying, block Huawei from being in your 5G networks, that's crippling to a company that is really ahead in looking at entering the market and being a leader on that front. That was Sam Sachs, fellow at New America. China will edge out the United States as the biggest retail market in the world this year. This according to a new forecast by research firm eMarketer. Online sales are a big part of China's growth. More than 35 percent of the country's retail sales in 2019 are estimated to come from e-commerce. Bloomberg's Selena Wang and Heidi Stroud-Watts talked with Andrew Lipsman, principal analyst at eMarketer Wednesday, about the report. It's certainly dampening our forecast a bit. And now we saw retail growth in excess of 8% last year. So we're bringing that down in our forecast to about 7.5%. But that's still going to run ahead of GDP growth. Um, and, and certainly that's a strong growth rate on a very large number for China. Um, a big part of what's driving it is the continuing growth of the middle class there, particularly in tier three markets and more rural areas as those consumers come online and, and engage in e-commerce for the first time. And a great deal of that still has to do with mobile penetration, right? I mean, at what point do we start to see some semblance of, I guess, saturation when it comes to retail sales online in China? Yeah, so, I mean, about one out of every $3 in retail would be transacted online. What's incredible is that, that we'll see uh, that number for mobile commerce surpass 80% this year. So eight out of $10 in the U.S., we're at about half of that percentage. Um, so really, that's, that's fueling a lot of the growth that we're seeing. And if you just look at mobile in the context of all of retail, it's going to push upwards to about 30% of all spending. I spoke to Alibaba President Mike Evans late last year, and he mentioned that big ticket items are slowing on the platform, but other areas like cosmetics, fashion and apparel are still going strong. Is that a broader trend that you're seeing in e-commerce in China? Yeah, I think obviously with uh, trying to rein in the credit in China, that's going to affect big ticket purchases. You know, we saw some of the slowdown in the smartphone market already. Um, so I, I think that that's something that's obviously of concern and can, can certainly push up those growth numbers quite a bit. We're seeing the U.S. being bolstered by uh, high ticket purchases in e-commerce. Um, I think the reverse is, is actually happening here in China now.
You know, for the longest time, it feels like these e-commerce behemoths like Alibaba have had a bit of a, a head-scratching moment when it comes to international expansion and how to replicate a very structurally, domestically Chinese phenomenon elsewhere in the world, right? But I want to pull up this graphic that I found really intriguing in terms of Chinese internet users outnumbering, in fact, more than double the entire U.S. population. So I'm wondering if you look at statistics like this, you know, do these companies in China actually need overseas markets? I think they can certainly grow to be uh, huge. In fact, we're forecasting that uh, Alibaba's uh, gross merchandise value in 2019 is going to surpass $1 trillion, um, which is really incredible to think about. Um, now, obviously, that doesn't all fall into their revenue, but uh, a huge amount of, of volume that's happening through these platforms. Do they need the other markets? No, but if they want continued growth and expansion, they are going to want exposure to these markets. And we've seen um, with a lot of Chinese internet companies, uh, you know, they can expand somewhat into other parts of Asia, Southeast Asia, but it gets harder and harder as you start thinking about uh, other uh, markets in, in uh, Europe and, and in North America. And Andrew, the data shows that these smaller players are really starting to eat into Alibaba and JD's businesses. If you take a look at this chart, you'll see that uh, Pinduoduo reached almost $70 billion in sales in 2018. So what are these smaller players doing that Alibaba and JD are not? Yeah, now all the players, even Alibaba is going to grow at almost 20% this year. So the market as a whole is growing, but it is eating into Alibaba's share. Pinduoduo is a really interesting example. Um, it's almost like Groupon on steroids and took this kind of group buying phenomenon and translated into this rural and tier three market that is growing so quickly. So they're very well aligned with the fastest growing segment of the population for the e-commerce market. Um, and you know that's really fueled really incredible growth to think about the fact that it, the company was founded in 2015, just a few years ago, and is already going to take 7% of the e-commerce market in China almost overnight. And Andrew, lastly, despite the broader economic slowdown in China and growing nationalism there, are you still seeing retailers internationally want to double down in that market to reach those large growing middle class consumers that you were just talking about? It's always, it's always a double-edged sword. I think that the complexity of going into China can always be difficult. And every company kind of wants to go into that market. But when they actually try and do it, they often find that it's a little bit more difficult than they had anticipated. And you often see these pull, pullbacks. Um, so they're going to continue to try. Uh, I don't know how successful all of them will be. Um, and so we'll have to see what happens there. Andrew, what's the next big thing that we're not already talking about in this space? Uh, well, I think Pinduoduo is, is maybe a good example of something that's new and novel and has taken off. And so what I'm wondering is, are, are we going to see some more of these um, new flavors of retail, not just that, that targets this segment, but that uh, almost kind of brings in some of these gimmicks to precipitate a new form of buying. So that's what I'm looking at. Usually you get these followers when you have a real success story. Um, so what's the next one that's going to take shape? Is it going to take shape in China? Or are we going to see copycats in other parts of the world? That was Andrew Lipsman with eMarketer. Coming up, our exclusive conversation with Chan Zuckerberg Initiative founder Priscilla Chan talking about a big new housing initiative. I also ask her how difficult it is to run a philanthropic organization right now tied to the Facebook brand. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at technology and follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Melinda Gates, thank you so much for joining us on Bloomberg Studio 1.0. Bill and I always look for any philanthropy we do to fill some of those gaps. Hi, I'm Emily Chang, and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. I think Facebook's how we won um, in a lot of ways. Do you ever take any of the tips and give them to your L.A. Clippers coach? <laughs> no! I will stand up for Canadian interests. I will only sign a deal that is good for Canada. Coming up on Bloomberg Best, the stories that shape the week in business around the world. Welcome to Bloomberg Big Decision. Really good to have you here. Thank you so much for having me today. We know this business inside and out. You've really built a conglomerate. We saw uh, amazing opportunities in the Middle East. They had the dream. You had to bring it to reality. Between the three of us, we can really do anything. I feel like this is where we should go.
to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. The philanthropic organization started by Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla Chan is backing a fresh effort to address the housing shortage in the San Francisco Bay Area, where an explosion of tech wealth has exacerbated inequality and an affordability crisis for middle and lower income residents. I spoke with Priscilla Chan, founder of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and Fred Blackwell, CEO of the San Francisco Foundation, about the project in an exclusive interview. I was really intimidated by getting involved in the housing space and really um, tried our best not to get involved um, because the problems feel so vast and beyond what any individual organization can um, really tackle. But what I realized working as a pediatrician and as an educator is that it is the common denominator for success. Like it is, uh, you know, when you look at a child who isn't getting enough sleep, their asthma isn't well controlled, they can't focus in the classroom oftentimes it comes down to a kid not get, having a safe place to sleep, not having a place to store their medications, not being able to rest at home. And so I realized that all the issues that we care about in order to ensure that our children are healthy and successful really do boil down to housing. And so we spent a lot of time working with Fred, um, religious groups, talking to businesses, community organizers to get a sense of like, what could we actually do together? and how can we leverage policy? Because like I said, we are small, um, we can contribute and do our best, but how can we actually build a partnership that encompasses all the stakeholders involved in the Bay Area? Now, some people think a small number of wealthy people shaping or architecting policy is kind of a scary thought. It works when you agree with the policy, but not so much when you don't. Why approach this as an investment fund plus a policy fund? So we actually have had the opportunity to work closely with Fred, with CASA, with um, faith-based groups. So this isn't something that um, one individual group came up with, but really a collaborative of folks that have come together with different viewpoints and come together around some consensus about what needs to get done. Fred, how much affordable housing will this kind of money create and how does that compare to what the area needs? Yeah, so, you know, between the investment fund and the policy fund, we think that we are going to be able to uh, produce about 8,000 uh, units of affordable housing, but also um, stabilize uh, many more households than that, because not only are we talking about uh, supporting the production of new housing, and, but we're also talking about um, the preservation of existing affordable housing, and we have a pretty ambitious program that is about protecting those who are vulnerable to gentrification and displacement uh, here in the Bay Area. So all of that together we think is going to have substantial impact. You've also got businesses involved. Facebook is part of this. Genentech is part of this. Microsoft just announced a $500 million housing initiative in Seattle. Why do you think tech executives are putting their money and their muscle behind this now? I think it's the realization that this is a problem that exists that impacts the greater community and they they have uh, they want to be able to be part of building the Seattle or the Bay Area into this place that people from all different backgrounds can come and be successful and it's uh, also understanding that looking at opportunities like the partnership where they can be part of being a like durable solution you know going at it alone is is a challenging thing and the fact that the partnership has really spent all this time uh, defining what is possible and what the needs are. I, I think um, having all different voices and stakeholders involved is attractive for everyone. Um, community leaders want to know that business is involved. Business wants, wants to know that there are folks that are really close to the problem and organizing and advocating um, for the long term that they can invest in. And it's that sort of collision of brilliance that's so exciting about the partnership for the base future. Uh, Fred, Amazon has been an interesting case study because we've seen Amazon have to leave Seattle to look for a second headquarters in part because they're blamed for the housing crisis there. Meantime, you have New Yorkers not wanting Amazon to come to their city. How much is tech exacerbating the housing crisis? You know, it's, it's a, a great question. I think one of the things that's really been interesting about our involvement in this is how um, the participation of the corporate sector and uh, the tech sector more specifically has evolved. Uh, when we first uh, started these kinds of conversations, there was a sense that um, 
th these kinds of issues were somebody else's problem. Uh, and what's happening is that uh, folks in the corporate sector and tech sector more specifically are starting to see this as a business problem. It's creating a situation where it's hard to recruit uh, good workers. People uh, say a lot of times people are getting job offers here in the Bay Area, then they'll look at Zillow or they'll look at Craigslist and they'll say, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so <laughs> yes. we've really reached a point where uh, this is not just a, a social problem, it's a business problem uh, as well. And so I think that uh, while it's taken a while, I think that the, the tech sector is starting to kind of absorb and take in a little bit more, not only kind of what the contribution has been to the problem, but also understanding what their contribution can be and should be to a solution. So we use the word crisis. What happens if these policy changes don't happen? What happens if the things you're calling for don't work? You know, the list is long, uh, to tell you the truth. And, you know, I'll start with the, the corporate sector and the economy here in the Bay Area. I think that we are really on the brink of killing the goose that laid the golden egg. Mm. Uh, if the trajectory stays the way that it is right now, people are going to start making different decisions around how they're gonna, where they're going to locate their businesses. Mm. People are going to start leaving the Bay Area because things are too expensive and the business costs are just too high. Priscilla, you're spending 100% of your time mm -hmm. at CZI now, yes. right? And it's evolved considerably mm -hmm. from, from when you first announced it. How difficult is it in this moment? to run a philanthropy connected to the Facebook brand, given the concerns about privacy, given the concerns about data, given the pile-on that we're seeing? Yeah, we've made tremendous progress in figuring out where our niche is as, at CZI in the philanthropic space. And um, I want to emphasize the fact that we're small compared to the fields that we're working on. And we're also not working on issues that are brand new. Um, we're focused on science. How can we cure and prevent and manage all disease? We're focused on making sure that students have access to high quality education. We're focused on justice and opportunity where we're really thinking about how can we unlock the opportunity that's lost in our criminal justice system, in our immigration system, in housing. And so these are big problems compared to um, what we're able to do in a given year. Now, at the same time that you are trying to do all this good in the world with the wealth that Facebook has created, you have people out there blaming Facebook for a lot of bad things. They want leadership changes. How do you reconcile that? You know, we have built an incredibly strong team at CCI. CCI and Facebook are two separate organizations. And um, what's happening at Facebook, Mark is working incredibly diligently on. And we have the opportunity to make sure that we uh, internalize those lessons as well. And But we have our, we, an independent organization with strong leaders that are dedicated to this work in the long term. Um, and so uh, we are excited about the opportunity to sort of be best in class and learn those lessons alongside Facebook while building our own organization. At the same time, there is overlap. So Chan Zuckerberg, San Francisco General Hospital, has your name on it, has Mark's name, name on it. You worked there. You've got politicians and nurses saying that his name should be taken off in light of the current scandals. How do you respond to that? You know, San Francisco General Hospital is a place where I grew up as a physician as a someone that cares for families and children. I've slept innumerable nights there, rushing to the emergency room, to the delivery room. And I've seen firsthand how important that hospital is as a safety net resource to everyone in this community. And I could not be more proud and honestly honored to be able to support the work that goes there on there because I've worked alongside all those doctors, nurses, technicians. And so I want to see that hospital succeed and I'm willing to do what's necessary to really make sure that that community has what it needs. And um, you know, we're proud to be able to put the machines into the uh, surgery units, do get the imaging units in place um, because I've seen firsthand how challenging it can be when you don't have the right resources to serve our city's most vulnerable individuals. This data issue is so important and I know data is important to Chan Zuckerberg, it's helping your work. Can you reassure people that their data is protected, that their data isn't going back to Facebook? Oh, well, our organizations are completely separate. There is no sharing of data. And in fact, a lot of our, uh, you know, we take data 
incredibly seriously. We have, um, you know, in our education work, signed on to the gold standard of um, student and family privacy uh, uh, policies. In science, we have co committed to open standards and work closely with scientific leadership to make sure that everything that uh, we engage with is treated uh, with the highest level of protection. And so um, that's a core uh, competency that we need to be very serious about and uh, take the responsibility very seriously. And so we have teams across the organization thinking about how to be the best stewards of this so that we can bring the promise of technology beyond, you know, getting pizza to this office immediately. You know, the promise of technology should really also be applied to making sure that we're advancing science, that we're uh, allowing students to reach their highest potential um, and really move uh, the promise te technology beyond the consumer world to a place where we can have real social impact. That was some of my conversation with Priscilla Chan, founder of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and Fred Blackwell, CEO of the San Francisco Foundation. You can catch the full conversation online. Well, Starbucks is expanding its delivery service with Uber Eats. The service will offer delivery in San Francisco on Tuesday and expand to Boston, Chicago, L.A., and other cities in coming weeks. The company said it plans to bring delivery to nearly a quarter of U.S. coffee shops in seven cities this spring and will test programs in other countries this year. Starbucks said 95% of its menu will be available through Uber Eats. The expansion adds another high-profile U.S. brand to Uber's delivery arm following its deal with McDonald's in May. Coming up, as the world's population grows, could the use of digital IDs benefit those who are falling through the cracks in society? And later, Netflix is dominating the Oscars. How Hollywood is reacting to the streaming strategy sweeping the industry next. This is Bloomberg. I was actually poor. No foreplay? Eat your bag of lays with a smile on your face. If all the diseases have been taken, I'll, I'll take a tax. As the world's population tops 7 billion people, more importance is being placed on how to identify and track people around the globe. A new report from McKinsey outlines the benefits of adopting a digital ID, which can impact government benefits, health care, financial services, and jobs. Olivia White, partner at McKinsey, spoke to Bloomberg's Selena Wang about the report on Wednesday. In a place like the U.S., it's very easy to take identification for granted. But if you go to developing countries, there are roughly one billion people who have no form of legal identification. That means they can't interact with their governments. They can't open a bank account. If they wanted to start a business or register it, they, they couldn't. And probably four to five billion people in the world have ID, but that don't give full functionality. And even, I don't know for you or me, I forget passwords regularly. I've forgotten two passwords this week, and it's hard sometimes to interact with companies. So what we wanted to do was to say, look, given those challenges, what's the benefit of an identification that can allow you to identify yourself via digital challenge, uh, channels in a high authentication way? It would certainly make all of our lives easier to not have to remember a million passwords yes. on a million different sites, but it has been implemented, this digital ID program, mm -hmm. in certain countries, right. but it's had pretty mixed results. So where has it been successfully done? Well, you know, I would say it's, it's at the early stages, so that's the reason for mixed results. But if you look at a country like Estonia on the small side, small country, but they've got all of their population essentially using a digital ID. On the larger side, India has got 1.2 billion people right now on a digital identification system. And in your research on seven countries, uh, extending full digital ID yeah. coverage could unlock economic value equivalent to 3 to 13 percent yeah. of GDP. So how exactly does that economic value creation happen? Yeah, well, so we looked at seven countries across the developed and developing world. Uh, we looked at Brazil, China, uh, Ethiopia, Nigeria, the U.S., and the U.K. And you see that across all of those countries, there are really six kinds of ways in which individuals interact and where value can be created through hundreds of use cases. So one is I interact as a consumer with a company. 
Another is I interact as a worker with my employee. Another is I've got a micro enterprise and I want to start a business. Sometimes I'll interact as a taxpayer or a beneficiary with my government, or I'll just be a citizen. Now, India's digital national ID program, which is actually the world's largest, was recently shown to be compromised. So what are some of the greatest risks here when it comes to privacy, identity fraud? Yeah, no, well, this is an incredibly important question because, you know, on the one hand, there's this potential for enormous good that can be unlocked by digital ID. But there are risks, too, and there's actually even the risk of misuse. In some ways, digital ID can be thought of as a dual-use technology, something like nuclear energy, where there's potential to unleash a huge amount of potential value, but there's also potential for downside if it's in the wrong hands. And as a result, things like the proper governance, the right legal framework, and really very careful controls and rules around privacy and user consent are incredibly important and are precisely the things needed to allow the benefit to be realized. Right. Some critics have called digital IDs one of the gravest risks to human privacy and identity. Yeah. So how do governments limit that downside? Could technologies like blockchain help? Well, sure, you know, what governments need to look at here for ID as for the full digital world are very similar. You know, there are lots of governments that are currently working as in the UK or, say, even here as in California um, at the right ways to set up legal frameworks around how data can be shared and also what sort of consent people need to give in order to get those benefits. Technologies like blockchain can help, but they're distinctly not the solution alone. You really need the legal framework and the right governance. And what are some of the differences in the way that emerging economies versus developed economies should implement these programs? Or is it expected that developing economies will leapfrog? Uh, I mean, emerging economies will leapfrog the developing ones? It's a tremendous opportunity for leapfrogging in developing countries because they're going from from places where you really have, it would give you a statistic, 45% of women in low-income countries don't have a legal form of identification, Wow. Um, compared to 30% of men in those same countries. So you have this huge gender gap. You often have instances in which just not enough people are included. And digital ID provides this mechanism for really inclusive growth and allowing people newly, in many ways, access to the digital world. And how will some of these biometric technologies, like improving facial recognition, you know, fingerprint scanning, iris scanning? Mm -hmm. You know, well, the technology answer to that is they're getting cheaper, they're getting uh, better at reducing false positives and false negatives, you know, better at making sure they're really identifying the right person. But those technologies, you know, as we were talking about earlier, really need to go along with the right protections for their use. And in what countries have you seen a sort of private and public partnership really help to achieve this uh, digital idea? identity program? Yeah, well, you know, Estonia is a really interesting and good example um, on the one hand because the government in many ways is the real driver, but what they do enables and uh, elicits the participation of the private sector tremendously. You then have a country like Sweden. In Sweden, excuse me, like, like, yes, like Sweden. So in Sweden, there's an identification program that was started by a consortium of banks um, that have worked together to establish this program that's then used also for certain sorts of public purposes. That was Olivia White, partner at McKinsey. Well, Amazon, in a move to improve its delivery service, will test a fleet of robots in the Seattle suburbs. The e-commerce giant announced a trial of Amazon Scout, an autonomous delivery device the size of a cooler that rolls along sidewalks at a walking pace. At the moment, it will use six robots, which are designed to navigate around obstacles like people and pets. Coming up, Netflix continues its campaign to dominate the entertainment industry. We will discuss the strategy as award season heats up. This is Bloomberg. Netflix has one more reason to brag in Hollywood. The streaming giant scored 15 Oscar nominations Tuesday, including for Best Picture for its film Roma. Roma got 10 nominations in all, including Best Director and Cinematography, tying with the favorite for most nods this year. The recognition by the Academy Cubs amid news that the company is joining major Hollywood studios in the Motion Picture Association of America. Bloomberg's Anusha Sakui joined us Tuesday from LA to discuss. 
It's Hollywood's highest prize, and it's voted on by, you know, uh, a large group of the industry, but it's voted on by the industry. It's not voted on by some group of journalists like the uh, Golden Globes is. Um, so it really is representation that Netflix is really considered one of... Uh, I don't want to say one of us because it doesn't include me, but like one of them, <laughs> one of Hollywood. Um, and uh, so, I mean, there are up to 10 that can be in the best picture nomination, but it's the highest price. So, and it's also, it's a black and white film. It's, uh, it's very little dialogue to some degree. There are no stars. So it's really on the base, you know, just the film itself, the cinematography, the direction, the acting. It's quite a raw film that, that it's got this far. Um, so uh, I think um, it says a lot about the, you know, what they've done to get Quaron, uh, Alfonso right. Quaron, to you know, to make the film there and and to market his film, and it, that says a lot to filmmakers and creators uh, who might be convinced to go to Netflix. Still, it appears the theater companies, AMC, Regal, are excluding Roma from their Oscar showcases. They're only playing the Best Picture nominees that played by the rules, which is you know a traditional theatrical release. You know, 90 days from being available to the public. AMC gave us a statement saying for more than a decade movie lovers have enjoyed the AMC Best Picture Showcase to catch up on nominated films that played at AMC throughout the prior year. This year Academy members nominated a film that was never licensed to play uh, in AMC theaters. As such it is not included in the AMC Best Picture Showcase. Is that a little sour grapes or do they have a point? Is this all coming to a head? Um, it's it's not sour grapes, it's just their stand. They really don't want to cave in any capacity they can uh, when it comes to this exclusive run of film, uh, exclusive run that they have, um, uh, and this window of three months. Um, it has, over the years, whittled down. You know, back in the day, remember, it used to take forever before you could see a movie at home. Now it's about three months, and it's usually Disney movies, the big superhero movies that last the longest before they're available at home. And uh, Netflix did part with its strategy with Roma and it gave it just three weeks before it, um, uh, it let it stream at home. Um, but even then, the big theatres weren't going to let, weren't going to show it. And, you know, a lot of people, when this film is nominated uh, or say when it wins, you know, yeah, they can see it at home, but they might choose to go out and, you know, maybe as a date night or whatever, go and see it at a cinema and pay for popcorn. And that's the business. Right. That's the theatre business. And they're choosing to not show it uh, for that reason, you know, for this sort of, um, uh, you know, this uh, principle. And uh, uh, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a big question in this next year, next two years, as other streaming uh, platforms come online, um, if this is going to come to a head. That was Bloomberg's Anusha Sakui. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. You can tune in every day, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. And we are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.